2008, Chris and I took a trip to Connecticut uh, to, to, uh, to visit a young man named Adam that's very close to us. We love Adam a lot. And he had moved to Connecticut and uh, had gotten very excited about the East Coast. He was from Colorado. We'd met him here in Montana. And while we were out there, he wanted to take us to Boston. How many of you have been to Boston? What an awesome city Boston is. And Adam was so excited to take us to Boston, so we'd taken kind of an all-day uh, road trip around New England states and whatnot, and we got to Boston at night. We had made reservations in a ho hotel, and uh, it was raining, the traffic was awful, and Adam drives like a bat out of Hades. I mean, it's a crazy driver. But he had this new fangled gadget on the dash of his car. It was a Garmin GPS. How many of you remember Garmin circa 2008, okay? Um, and so he's driving about 75 on the freeway. We're trying to find the, uh, the exit to get to our hotel. And every time that the Garmin would say, turn here, it would be just after we'd missed the turn. So we'd make, you know, we'd, we'd get off the freeway, come back around, get off again and come. And we did that about three times. And finally I said, Adam, your, your Garmin is a piece of crap. I'm going to pull out my, wait for it, Blackberry, because I have, I have Google Maps on my Blackberry. And so we had these two voices trying to, and I don't know how we ever found the hotel, but we eventually got there. You, man, and now with Google Maps, how many of you use Google Maps these days in your car? And it's so cool because they warn you about two miles away that your exit is coming up, and then you get that little animation. So, I mean, I just think technology is awesome, right? Uh, love it, love it so much. Today, I want to give you a Google Maps roadmap of where Connect has been, where we are today, and where we're headed. And I'm really excited to share this message with you. I want to say thank you this morning before we jump into all of this. Um, I'm very grateful to my team. Um, I've been preparing to share this with you and and if you've been here the last several weeks, I've been telling you I want to share what I, what I feel like God is putting on my heart for the vision for Connect and where we're going. Um, and I've been, I've been kind of sharing these ideas with lots of people in my life to make sure that I'm right in the center of where Jesus is taking us. And, and my team has been so good to help me refine this, this message and this vision. And some of them have said, uh, man, you're way off base, Russ. You've got you to gotta pull it back over here. And then uh, this week, my friend Wele, uh, we, we had coffee this week, and when we were all done, he called me up and he said, Russ, I think you've got to make a big revision. And, and Wele, I'm so, I'm so grateful for your friendship and your influence. And then on Friday, my friend Ted Lang stopped by my house, and he brought me a book. And he had called me earlier and wanted to know if I wanted the book before this message on Sunday, and I said, Wele... I said Ted, not Wele. Wele and Ted are two different people. Um, I said, Ted, I, I, I love this author, and I'm sure the book is very good, but I don't have time to read the book before Sunday. And Friday, he rang my doorbell, and he brought in the book, and he said, Russ, you were flippant with me on the phone, and you need to read the book before Sunday. And so, Ted... I read the whole book yesterday. <laughs> and I'm grateful for people in my life who keep me in the center of where Jesus is. So you know who you are. Thank you. Um, sometimes this old German skull is kind of thick. But I'm listening. Jesus is speaking to us. Who didn't think that would happen? Just wanted to say thank you. Didn't want to cry. Let's talk about where we've been. You guys, Connect has been on mission for 15 years. Two weeks ago was actually our 15th anniversary of launching Connect Church. We started in 2008. 
we were a part of a great movement in America and really around the world of church planting as a strategy for reaching people who don't know Jesus. Uh, we, we launched in 2008, and, and our, our grand opening at River Rock Community Center landed on the front page of the Bozeman Chronicle. And in those days, people actually read the Bozeman Chronicle, so that was awesome. <laughs> but we were a part of a wave of church planters who were committed to the mission of Jesus that is most succinctly stated in Luke chapter 19, where Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. This verse, this statement of Jesus, moves me and it motivates me to do what I do. And we planted Connect Church 15 years ago because uh, studies had been showing that unchurched people or de-churched people were more likely to come to a new church than they would be to come to a church that had been around for many, many years. And it was an effective way of uh, of reaching people who don't know Jesus yet. And I'll never forget one of the first people that said yes to Jesus there at, at the River Rock Community Center. Uh, we, we were having our, our morning gathering on a Sunday, and this young man walks in the doors. I found out later that his life was in shambles. He was in all kinds of trouble. And uh, he'd gotten up that morning, and he was on the phone with a friend, and he said to his friend, I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to go to the first church that I see. And it just so happened that Connect Church was the first church that he saw. And we had these little plywood hand-painted signs out front. Some of you remember those signs. He saw that sign, and he walked in, and that morning at the end of my talk, he said yes to Jesus. And he's been walking with Jesus for 15 years. He's still a part of our church. That moves me. That motivates me. Over the years, we've had the honor to pray with hundreds of people to begin a walk with Jesus. We've baptized so many people. We've just baptized dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Amanda, go ahead and go to that, that video because it's just so cool. These are I mean, these are the early days. You, you can see I was thinner and had less facial hair. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know how to, if you've ever been able to baptize somebody in water, if you've ever been able to lay your hands on them, you know that it's just such a thrill and such an honor because this is the entry point into the life of the Spirit and the life of following Jesus. And it's happened to us for 15 years. We've prayed with people to receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and we've watched their lives transform. We've, we, we, it, it's just been 15 years of heaven on earth for me and Chris. I'll, I'll never forget that young man. He was so excited to be baptized. <laughs> and about six or seven years into the Connect Church history, uh, somebody on our staff said, Russ, we just need you to define what the vision is for Connect Church. Where are we going? What do we need to do? Where are we headed? And that launched for me a, an intense time of prayer and, and Bible study and just asking Jesus, what, what is our vision? And a short time later, uh, our, our team came up with this vision statement that many of you will remember, more disciples, more leaders, more churches. And we talked about it, we taught on it, we tried to do it, we did all these things. That vision came from my study of Luke chapter 5, and I've talked about this lots of times, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is teaching by the Sea of Galilee. He's in a boat that he'd commandeered from Simon Peter. And he's teaching from this boat, and when he's done teaching, he says to Peter, hey, why don't you launch out into the deep waters and let down your nets, you're going to catch a whole bunch of fish. And Peter said, hey, Jesus, we've been fishing all night long. There's no fish. It's a waste of time. And then he said this awesome thing. He said, but if you say so, I will. I love that. And when they went out and they put the nets down, you probably know the story. They began to pull the, the nets up, and there were so many fish in the nets that it actually began to make the, the, the boat sink. And so it says, a shout for help brought their po partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish, and both boats were on the verge of sinking. And so 
as I was studying, I felt like Jesus said to me, this is like a metaphor for Connect Church. The fish represent more disciples. Jesus is calling us to make more disciples. The other fishermen that Simon Peter called to come and help represent more leaders that need to be deployed for ministry. And the boats represented more churches. And, and so we, we, we have worked that vision statement, and I believe that that was the direction of the Lord for a long period of time here at Connect. The end of that story, you probably know this too, Jesus says this to Simon, because Simon freaks out when he sees this miracle of the fish. And Jesus says to Simon, listen, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. That's the mission of Jesus. And listen, for 15 years, we, we've been doing it. I went back and pulled up some statistics this week. I love data. Anybody else love data? There's some people that love Venn diagrams. I'm not that person. Here's some, here, here's some stuff that's happened with Connect Church. We've had full, more than 400 people give their lives to Jesus in 15 years. We've had, we've had more than 350 people baptized in water. And, and listen, when I'm paying attention to data, I care more about baptisms than raised hands because baptism means I'm really serious about what I'm doing, right? So that number makes me excited. We've empowered and mentored dozens of Christian leaders. Some have gone out from us and they're serving around the world literally. We've been involved in church planting here in Montana and with church planters. We've financially supported church planters worldwide. We're real serious about more disciples, more leaders, and more churches. And, and here's the truth. Connectors are people fishers. It's in our DNA. We're people fishers. But three years ago, you know, everything changed. Pandemic. I made that slide and immediately hated it. <laughs> we went through shutdowns. We went through the drama of masking. Politics exploded in 2020. I mean, you were all with it through me. With it through me. You were with me through it. Uh, Geico had a commercial in 2020 that I actually made a ringtone on my phone. This narrator said, these days, nothing is normal and everything is weird. <laughs> and I felt like that was my theme in 2020 and 2021. And to be honest with you this morning, for two years, the only vision I had was survival. All I could see was survival. Churches were closing their doors all over the country. There were a whole lot of people that had been attending church that just decided it wasn't important to them anymore. Giving began to, to dissipate. Uh, we had a budget, we have a mortgage, we have a staff. Things got tight, and all I could focus on was survival. And I would think about this vision statement, more disciples, more leaders, more churches, and I, I, I'd ask Jesus, how in the world can we do anything other than just survive? I talked with a business leader this week about, about this crisis that I had of only being able to see survival, and this business leader said to me, that's the only vision I had too. All I could see was survival. We've, we, we, we've been through a lot. And honestly, I could relate to Nehemiah. If you're with us for the first time today, we're in a message series. I'm taking a break from our regular message series today. Uh, but early in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah gets this message from some of his relatives that lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The wall was destroyed. And some of his relatives had gone back to Jerusalem. And, and when they got to Nehemiah, they said this. It's up on the screen. They said to me, Nehemiah's writing this, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. I could relate to this. This is how I felt in 2020 and 21. It, things aren't going well for us. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. It felt like the wall of Connect Church had been torn down. And the gates have been destroyed by fire. 
And Nehemiah says, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted and I prayed to the God of heaven. And in that season, guys, this is kind of how I felt. I was in mourning for what Connect Church had been. I was in mourning for what was happening to the people of God nationwide and worldwide. The church was in crisis. But all I could see was survival. I couldn't see anything bigger than survival. So I started to pray. You want to know what my prayer was? God, I need a better vision than survival. And the reality is God answered my prayer. We survived. Woohoo! we're here, right? We made it. But now... We need a better vision than survival. We've got to figure out where Jesus is calling us, and I've been asking God where we're going. What's the fresh vision? What are you asking us to do? And where are you going to take Connect Church in this next season? It took me about 18 months for that to really solidify, but I'm excited to share my thoughts with you this morning. Let me talk about where we are right now got four bullet points. First one is this. God is moving at Connect Church. Do you feel it? God is moving and there's good stuff happening. The Holy Spirit is speaking. I I feel like there's this, this energy and this anticipation. Every time we come together, people are expecting God to speak and they're expecting God to do something significant. God is moving at Connect. We're no longer in survival mode. Second thing I want you to know is people are, once again, saying yes to Jesus. Remember the story I told you about the young man who just walked into the first church he found? That happened to us again about three weeks ago, except it happened with Google because that's how people do things today. Um, Young woman who had experienced incredible tragedy in her life, Googled church, found her way to Connect Church, walked in, one of our leaders prayed with her to say yes to Jesus. Now she's plugged into a group and she's growing. It's happening again, friends. Connect is growing again. I mean, look around you. The the room is getting full. It's awesome. And, And I'm so happy to share this with you. Our budget is healthy again. I am so tired of talking about money. And our budget is healthy. I I shared with you in January, I I shared a graph with you. It looked something like this coming up on the screen in January. You know in December, uh, we had been short. The 1st of December, we were were down about $40,000. And after the new year turned, you guys had given so much money that we came within about $100 or $60 of making our budget. We had budgeted, on the right-hand column, we had budgeted for a loss for the year. No, 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 go back, go, go, go back. Is that, the, is that the first one, Amanda? All right, all right. We had budgeted for a loss of about, of about 1671, and, and as of the 1st of January, um, we had a loss for the year, and it was a miracle that we got there to that 17. 31 number, and and we all applauded and we shouted. What I didn't know is that there was a check from from a connector who was away for a while. There was a check that got lost in the mail, and about a month later, the check came, and it was for 2022 giving, and it was for $2,000, which means we ended the year, go ahead now to the next one, we ended the year $516 in the black, okay? You're not clapping very enthusiastically, but I'm really excited. So God is moving. People are saying yes to Jesus. Connect is growing. Our budget is is healthy again. And that's where we are. But really what I want to talk to you about today is where we're headed. Where are we going? When I prayed that God would give me a fresh vision, I was serious about it. And I was asking him for something fresh and new. And this is what I want to share with you today very simply. I believe that Jesus is saying to us as connectors, let's get back to people fishing. We've had our focus on a whole bunch of other stuff. Budgets and and whatnot. 
survive. What? Let's get back to people fishing. This is what Jesus is saying to connectors, is we've got to get back to that, that missional focus in which we're helping people reconnect to God and, and, and find life in Jesus. Let's get back to people fishing. You've heard about the, the revivals that are happening around America. Young people are coming to know Jesus. Are you aware of this? Do you know what a hunger there is among college students for, for, for Jesus? Several weeks ago, there, there was a revival that has broken out at Asbury College in Virginia, and, and people literally from all over the world, I saw a graph where they graphed all the people. Uh, I, I think at, at one point there were 50,000 people in this tiny little town that had come in to experience the revival in Asbury. People are hungry for Jesus. That, that revival is still going on. They've shut it down to visitors because the city literally can't, can't take care of all those people. They don't have restaurants and hotels. But, but the college students are praying night and day and seeking Jesus. And, and a spark has caught on in some of the other college towns around, around the country. I've read things at Texas A&M, that revival is sparking out at Texas A&M. It, it, it's happening in some other Christian colleges around the country. Students are just on their faces day and night seeking the presence of the Lord. Are you aware we live in a college town? Is it possible that revival that, had, that, that started in Virginia could make its way all the way to little old Montana. Yeah. I believe that it could because, listen, young people are hungry for Jesus. On, on Tuesday, Chris and I went to see the movie Jesus Revolution. Have you seen it? We, we went to see it on Tuesday and... and um, It was stunning. The idea of the movie, the story of the movie, if you haven't seen it, is it's, it's, the, it's the history of the hippies in the 1960s and 1970s who had been trying to satisfy the hunger in their soul with drugs, sex, and rock and roll. And all of a sudden, they began to find Jesus. And there was this whole movement of hippies that became Christians and, and began to follow Jesus in the 1960s. Time Magazine did a cover story on this, on this thing, and, and the story was called The Jesus Revolution. Hippies abandoning drug, sex, and rock and roll and coming to Jesus. One of the most powerful moments in the movie for me as a pastor was when uh, Chuck Smith, played by Kelsey Grammer, Chuck Smith plays this pastor of this little church. He's got a teenage daughter who is fed up with church. She doesn't like church. She's not really sure she's interested in Jesus. It's breaking his heart. And then all of a sudden, she meets a hippie somewhere out in the community. This hippie has been turned on to Jesus, and she invites him over to the house to meet her dad. And his dad, her, Chuck Smith, isn't having it very much. But they invite the hippie to church, and, and, and he comes, and he kind of likes what he sees, even though people aren't really friendly there in, in that little old Calvary Chapel church in the day. And the next week, he invites a bunch of his hippie friends, and before much time goes on, one whole side of the church is packed with hippies, and the old folks are on the other side of the church. And the Sunday that it looked like that in this movie, there was a confrontation between the pastor, Chuck Smith, and some of his big donors in the church. And they said, Pastor Chuck, we're not going to put up with this. We're not going to put up with this. They don't look right. They're not living right. We don't want them in our church. And Chuck said, but they need Jesus. You know what they said? They don't wear shoes and they have dirty feet and we don't want them to ruin our new shag carpet. That's exactly what happened in that church. So you know what Chuck Smith did? The very next Sunday, he sat on the ground at the door of the church and he washed everybody's feet that came through the doors. And he looked at those big donors who didn't want dirty people in his church and he said, really? It's about the carpet for you? And it sparked a revolution that swept the world. And the leaders who were part of that, the, the leaders who were part of that Jesus revolution started the Calvary Chapel network of churches, there's more than a 1,000 of them worldwide today. 
It sparked the vineyard movement. I have no idea how many vineyard churches are in the world today. And it started the Harvest Crusades with Greg Laurie, who has a worldwide ministry today and has churches all over the country. Listen, that's what revival looks like is when we decide that we're not afraid of dirty people. There's a reason Connect Church doesn't have shag carpet. It's not just because it's ugly. (laughs) These hard floors that can be easily mopped send a message that everybody's welcome here. A couple of weeks ago, Kelly shared um, some statistics from Barna. We've all seen the statistics about how many churches are are falling apart post-pandemic and how people aren't going to church anymore. But Barna did a study where they just contacted a bunch of people. This was last October. And they asked people about their spiritual hunger. You want to know what they found? Kelly already, already shared this a couple of weeks ago. They found that spiritual hunger is at an all-time high in our country today. 74% of the respondents said they want to grow spiritually. believe in God or a higher power. 44% say they are more open to God now than they were before the pandemic. And 80% of the people that responded to the survey said they believe that a spiritual realm exists. Kelly sent me a picture of a chart that she drew. Uh, Go ahead and go to that next, uh, get to that chart if you can. There it is. I just want you to sit with that for a second. Gen Zs, Millennials, Gen X, Baby Boomers. What does that say to you? People are hungry. And just since we're talking about the generations, JD, I want you to know that as a young Baby Boomer, I know what Venmo is. And I have it on my phone. (laughs) Listen, guys. People are hungry for Jesus. And so we've got to get ready. It it is is non-negotiable for Connect Church to be ready to receive the people who are hungry for Jesus that are going to come into this church who might not look like us. And they might have dirty feet. We need groups. We need more groups. We need mentors. We need people who will host people in their home and will not just lead people to Jesus, but teach them what it means to walk with Jesus. We've got to get back to people fishing so that we are spiritually ready when we encounter hungry people who are hungry for Jesus and might be satisfying that their, their, their spiritual hunger was something completely off the wall. In the 1960s, it was drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Chris and I, the last week, have been asking ourselves, who, who are the hippies of our day? Who are the people in our culture that when they walk into a church, nobody loves on them? Who are the people in our culture that are considered dirty by Christians, too dirty to welcome into our super clean floors? Do you have a people group in your mind? The first people group that Chris and I began to talk about is that your ringtone? Good choice, bro. (laughs) The first people group Chris and I began to talk about was the LGBTQ community. This is a community of people who are literally dying to be loved. But when they walk into a church, All they feel is criticism and condemnation. A couple of years ago, 
I did a series of messages. I think, Kelly, you were teaching with us. We did that series of messages uh, on questions people were asking. And we took questions for the congregation, and a lot of the questions were about LGBTQ people. I taught on it. I taught about what God thinks of them. I taught about how we need to, how we need to love people unconditionally. And right after I was done teaching, a man walked up to me and said, Pastor Russ, I don't want those people in my church. It's just like what was happening in the 1960s. That can't be who we are. The carpet isn't more important than people's souls. And, 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 and I have this hunch in my spirit that, that as loud as the activist voices are shouting in our culture for love and acceptance and celebration of LGBTQ stuff, as, as loud as they're shouting, I believe there's going to be a wave of people that are all of a sudden going to wake up and discover Jesus is what they're really hungry for. Jesus is what they need. Jesus is what is going to satisfy that deep craving. And are we going to be ready? Connect, are we going to be ready when they start coming through our doors? We have to be ready. It's not an option. Because this is what Jesus is doing in our world today. I've been dreaming about some other things. Who will we reach? If we, get, if we get back to people fishing, if we really get down and get serious about people fishing, who else will we reach? I've, I've been aware ever since I, since I moved here that we have a huge homeless population in the Gallatin Valley. When we moved here in 2007, we were shocked to find out that Bozeman didn't have a rescue mission. Most of the larger communities in, Bo in, in Montana have a rescue mission run by Christian people who are helping meet the physical needs of homeless people and then lead them to Jesus and discipleship and that kind of stuff. And, and, and to this day, Bozeman still doesn't have a rescue mission. There's more resources now than there were 15 years ago. Uh, we, HRDC is doing a wonderful work, but HRDC doesn't introduce people to Jesus. And, and I've been dreaming for years about what it would look like for Connect to make a significant dent on the homeless community. And, and this week, after seeing Jesus' revolution, I began asking the Lord again, would, would you lead us to do something significant for homeless people? Somebody sent me a link this week to um, an, an Instagrammer by the name of Jimmy Darts. Do any of you know this name? Don't, don't, don't look him up now because I want you to stay with me, but write this down. You need to follow Jimmy Darts. Jesus lit a fire in him for radical generosity. And he began just asking the Lord, God, who do you want me to give a ridiculous amount of money to? And then he began documenting it on his social media accounts. Uh, one time the Lord said to Jimmy, uh, I want you to give away half of what's in your bank account. And he said, Lord, I can't afford to give away what's half of my... And the Lord said, do it, do what I tell you. So he gave away to some rando half of what he had in his bank account, and he said he never had to worry about money again. He just started living in obedience to what God, God just told him to give money away. Now he's got a, a million plus followers on social media, and people are sending him money to give away to other people. It's just crazy what he's doing, okay? But he's really serious about helping people feel the love of Jesus through the act of radical generosity. What if we became that people? Another dream I have is the, the very uncomfortable fact that our online presence is really inadequate. <laughs> have you joined us on Facebook? The sound is terrible. I mean, I just want you all to know, it's terrible. And if people are looking for a church, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go to our social media pages, they're going to go to our website, they're going to check out what's happening at Connect Church, and if they hear what the music sounds like online, which has nothing to do with how good it is in the room, would you say amen to that? Our music is great, okay? 
But, but here's the problem, and, and if you're not a techie, you wouldn't know how, how this worked. But we've, we've got our, our volunteers and the people that serve up in the booth, and they make everything in this room sound wonderful. But even if they put on noise-canceling headphones, they can't, they can't isolate the sound well enough to be able to send a good, balanced signal out to social media. What we need and what churches that do online church well do is we need a completely different room in a different part of the building that is soundproofed and has all new equipment, different equipment, so somebody can sit in that room and make sure that it sounds good on our online thing. It would cost tens of thousands of dollars, and we would need a whole bunch more people to serve in that ministry. It, it's, it's what we need. But if we're going to be significant in reaching our community, our online presence needs to be better. Do you know what I'm saying? And so these are some of the dreams that I'm wrestling with. Now, there's, there's, there's some dreams that we can start right now. Can we just start being a church that welcomes people warmly? No matter what they look like, no matter what they're wearing, no matter how dirty their feet are. I don't think we really worry about that anymore. I'm using that as a metaphor. You get it, right? If somebody walks in and they're wearing a hat or clothing that would communicate that they have a different political affiliation than I do, could I love them anyway? One of the things that my wife told me last week, I, I had no idea. Last week, we had 25 first-time guests at Connect Church. Do you want to be on mission? You can be on mission right in this room by just loving somebody and keeping an eye out for somebody you don't know, you haven't met before, and walk up and say, hi, my name is Russ. What's your name? Is there anything you need prayer for today? I would love to pray for you. What if you walked up to somebody who had never said yes to Jesus before and offered to pray with them, and they said, I heard the pastor talk about Jesus, but I don't know him. That's people fishing right here in this room. You don't even have to go out of the room. You can people fish right here. You can love people in your family that you don't think are lovable. Instead of avoiding that gay guy at work, you can wrap your arms around him and lead him to Jesus. It doesn't cost a thing. All we gotta do is say, I love the people Jesus loves. And newsflash, according to the Bible, Jesus loves everybody. Some of these other dreams that I have cost a lot of money. I really want to get our online presence taken care of, but it costs a lot of money. And as you saw, I mentioned earlier, we ended last year $500 in the black. There's not a lot of wiggle room in our budget. So I'm praying about it. I'm asking the Lord, God, will you just light a fire in somebody that will give $100,000 to sound equipment? Will you light a fire in, a, in about 25 people that would say, I will be the people who will create the system and make it happen? Because we need people and we need money. And this one, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little scared to share. This is what I heard the Lord say. The Lord said to me that connect is going to retire the mortgage in a short period of time. I believe that's a promise from the Lord. I don't regret at all borrowing money to move into this building. We had no other options. Believe me, the last thing I ever wanted to do was build a church. I've been in building projects before and it's a nightmare. This one was no exception. No offense to those of you that were involved in it. Didn't wanna do it. We had no other choice. And the Lord performed miracle after miracle after miracle to get us into this building. It, I, you're amening because you remember, don't you? You remember when we were applying for a loan and our, our balance sheet was $44,000 short and I shared it on a Sunday morning and a first-time guest that had never been to Connect Church before delivered a check from her bank for $44,000 to my front door. It was a miracle to get us into this building, but we had to borrow $2.2 million. Our payments monthly on this building are $12,500 a month. What could we do with that money if the, if the mortgage was paid off? 
And we've already got a bunch of people that are giving, uh, giving every month to debt retirement. We, we make our mortgage payments every month, but in addition, last year we paid down the debt an additional $12,000 just because people are giving extra to get rid of the debt. What if everybody in Connect were giving a little bit more to get rid of that debt? Or what if everybody in Connect were saying, hey, I want to fund the vision of going people fishing. I'll give a little bit extra so we can do something crazy for the kingdom and get people saved. I know that retiring debt isn't very sexy and I don't have a plan and I don't have a strategy. We're not going on some fundraising scheme. That's not where I'm going. I'm just saying God has told me this is going to happen. And when God says it, I, I, I've watched. It's been 15 years of miracles around here. He's going to do something crazy. Buckle your seatbelts. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. The Bible says if we're faithful with a little, he will give us more. So I don't expect that we're going to do any crazy people fishing stuff until we're just faithful with the 25 visitors that are probably here this morning until we just start doing small things and loving people well. When God sees that we're obedient to the call and the vision of people fishing, when, when, when Jesus sees that we'll do what he calls us to do, he's gonna give us a little bit more. And I believe that if we'll just walk this out with him, we're gonna see crazy things happen in the future. Because God said it. I believe it. What's the rest of it? That settles it. Thank you, Waylay. Yeah. Do you feel it? Let's get back to people fishing, guys. Let's get out of the scarcity mindset. Let's get out of the survival mode. And let's get back to people fishing. I want to end this way. I talked about Nehemiah earlier and how he wept and he fasted and he prayed. And I want to lead us this morning in prayers of repentance because that was the next thing that Nehemiah did. And then after, after he repented, God gave him strategy and he went back to Jerusalem and he rebuilt the wall in 53 days. 53? I always get the number wrong. 52. Thank you. I keep looking at Kelly because she's our resident Bible scholar. <laughs> at least you're, you're the resident Nehemiah scholar for sure. 52 days. But it began with a prayer of repentance. And, and uh, we're going to go to this, this verse in Nehemiah in just a second. Go back, Amanda. I'm messing with you this morning. I'm sorry. Before we do, I want to... This is the book that Ted brought me this week. In this book, the author Derek Prince is talking about revival. We're seeing revival spark around the country. We need revival here. Derek Prince writes about revival. He says he's British. He says, I believe Britain is like Namaqualand, a place in Africa. It is dry and barren, but under the surface there are seeds of biblical truth. This is true of America as well. Dry and barren, but under the surface there are seeds of biblical truth. Over our long history, this nation, as far as I understand it, has had more exposure to the truth of the Bible than any other nation on earth. The seeds are still there. Once the rain falls, we will be astonished at what comes up. That is my belief. That is my vision. And I pray for its manifestation every day. That's what revival is. A coming to life from apparent deadness. 
Many people talk about revival as if it is synonymous with evangelism, but I feel like the two need to be distinguished from each other. While I believe passionately in evangelism, people fishing, it's not the same as revival. Revival means bringing back to life something that has died. Evangelism is presenting the truth to people who have never had life. Revival brings back to life people who once had life and then died. Evangelism brings the life-giving word to unconverted people. Revival is for the church. Once revived, the church can reach out effectively in evangelism. Once revived, we can effectively start people fishing. And so what I want to end with today is praying together Nehemiah's prayer of repentance and asking the Lord to revive what has died in my life, in your life, in our lives. Make sense? Would you stand to your feet? I'm going to ask you to read this out loud with me. And if this is coming from your heart as it is from mine, would you raise your hands as you pray it? Just uh, in, in the surrender posture that we, we did earlier. Pray this prayer with me, starting with, O Lord, God of heaven. Let's go. O Lord, God of heaven the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. Say that again, but put in there, your people connect. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, connect. Let's pray it one more time and put in the United States of America. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, the United States of America. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations you gave us through your servant Moses. Now listen, that, that's, that's old covenant. The way we've sinned is we haven't stayed connected to Jesus. We have sinned terribly by not staying connected to Jesus. Say it with me again. We have sinned terribly by not staying connected to Jesus. One more time. We have sinned terribly by not staying connected to Jesus. Verse eight, please remember what you told your servant Moses. Please remember what you said to us through Jesus. Please remember, God, that we live in the new covenant of grace in which when we confess our sins, bam, we get forgiveness of sins right here, right now. No argument, no discussion. You take our sins and you take them as far as the east is from the west. Please remember, God, that that is what you promise. And we stand, Jesus, on that promise. And as we have confessed our sins and as we're gonna continue to confess our sins, Jesus, we pray, we pray, for the rains to come. Jesus, there, there are seeds under the surface of this nation. There are seeds under the surface of this valley. There are seeds under the surface of this church that once the rains come, they're going to sprout up and they're going to be able to bloom again. We're going to see restoration and renewal. We're going to see revival. God, revival is for the church. We hunger and thirst for Bring revival, Jesus, bring revival. And with it, Jesus, bring a renewed passion for people fishing so that we can see people come to Jesus. 
Jason, you want to come, please? I'm going to ask Jason to lead us in a prayer of repentance, okay? Whatever's on your heart. And then anybody else who wants to lead us in a prayer of repentance, would you come down and just make a line down here? We're going to repent for a while. We're going to seek the Lord for revival together. And some of you have a word in your heart. I want you to come and lead us in prayer. Musicians, would you begin to pray as Jason, as Jason prays? It's on. Oh, there we are. First thing, activation. <clears throat> how many... <laughs> this is my best friend. How many of you believe what he spoke today? <clears throat> you know, I, I get the privilege of reading the message notes beforehand. I get to cheat. And I text him this week and I said, man, this is going to be phenomenal. So if you agree with that, would you just give your senior pastor a love clap? Just shower him. Come on. Thank you. And it's real simple. The activation, like what I'm feeling is how many of you know somebody that maybe used to attend here that doesn't go here anymore? If that's you, raise your hand. If you know somebody that used to go here and they don't come here anymore, just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have somebody in your life you think, meh, I could probably invite them to church? If that's you, raise your hand. Pretty simple, right? It's really simple. Hey, I'm going to church on Sunday. I'll meet you there. I'll buy you a cup of coffee at our cuppy stand. It's free. It's free. I know. That's the best part, right? It doesn't cost you anything, right? I think the thing that, that was it's always been hard for me is my reputation, right? It's like, what if I invite them and they don't like it or they hear something whatever, or they hear somebody speaking in tongues, or uh, this bearded guy gets up there and talks about Jesus healing people instantly, right? Or sharing something out of the Word that contradicts everything that I've held on for 44 years because I've been religious, right? I think when I get to heaven, I'm not going to care about what my reputation was. So I'm speaking to myself because I have people that I haven't invited because I get timid sometimes, right? But I am making a commitment to you as one of your elders that I'm not going to be timid anymore. There's a revolution and a people that need Jesus. Heaven's not too big. Hell is, but not heaven. So if that's you and you said, I know somebody I need to invite, just raise, just again, we're just going to pray for those people right now. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance. And I know waylay has got something. So Father, right now, I pray that even this week, even this moment, even if they're watching online, Lord, I pray that you begin to bring back our friends, that you begin to bring back those people who walked away from you in the pandemic those who were upset by political ideologies, who were upset by masks, or you didn't do this, or you did that, and I didn't like this, and I'm just walking away. So, Father, right now, we ask that you would just give us courage, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us understanding on how to bring those people back. And, and Lord, uh, and, and for new people, Lord, new people around us, when we're in the grocery stores, when we're at work, and when we're just out and about, Lord, that you would just put somebody on our mind, Lord. And it's just a simple, I would just love to invite you to my church. It's that simple. So, Lord, as a body, as a group of believers, Lord, we just confess our sins to you and we say no more. Lord, those of us that have struggled with 
as Nikki said last week, pornography in the past. Lord, we confess and we repent of that. Lord, for those of us who have held on to our money and who have been scared about tomorrow, Lord, we declare that all of our hope and our trust and our faith is in you, Lord. For those that you are planting that seed right now and how to eliminate debt, I pray as you would just begin to be fruitful in that, Father God. Those of us, Lord, who need healing in our bodies, that you would just begin to release that right now, Father God. We speak to hips, and we speak to joints, and we speak to shoulders, and we speak to depression, Lord, and we, uh, we speak to financial insecurity right now in the name of Jesus, because you are a God who has cattle. Your word tells you you have a cattle on a thousand hills, Lord. Lord, your streets are made of gold, so there is nothing that's impossible for you if we put our hope and our faith and our trust in you, Lord. So today, uh, another monumental step in the, in, in, a, in the connect history, Lord, will be today that you have begun to set us free, that you have begun to challenge us, that you have begun to, uh, Lord, just to, to take away our sins. And if you don't know my Jesus, I would love to introduce you to you. There's hundreds of people here who would love to introduce to you. So it's just real simple. All you got to do is look around and say, hey, help me find your Jesus. It's that simple. It's that simple. So, Father, today, today, we just confess our sins we look toward to the future, Lord, and I pray for our pastor right now that you would give him wisdom and direction and vision, and you would surround him with armor bearers, Lord, that would help him carry this. Lord, pray that you would just put it in his mind that he does not have to do this alone. He's not on an island, Lord, but he has a group that would surround him, that would love on him and Chris and Nikki, and they would war for him, and they would pray for visions, Lord. I pray that you would wake us up in the middle of the night. Thank you, God as we cry out for him, as we cry out for Kelly, Lord. We cry out for our teaching team, and we cry out for our elders, Lord. Just use us, Lord, to impact this valley and to see Russ's vision for more fish come to pass. So we thank you for what you're going to do, Lord. We thank you for your, Lord, thank you for your salvation and your ability to forgive. And we declare all these things in your name, Father. Amen, amen.